Welcome to the session on responsible internet usage. Uh, I welcome you at the UN's Internet Governance Forum meeting. As you know, UN IGF is one of the world's most impactful forums with membership of 193 countries. And in this forum, the 17th IGF in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa, we have 170 plus countries registered with 4,000 uh, delegates. And uh, we are hosting this. I welcome Dinu, my panelist. Uh, so we are hosting this forum here at Banquet Hall A. And I want to give you a brief overview of our uh, dynamic coalitions which are hosting this. Uh, before we get into that, uh, the dynamic coalition on digital health and the dynamic coalition on internet and jobs. The dynamic coalition on internet and jobs was founded in 2019 with the goal to leverage the potential of internet to create jobs across sectors. And we come out with our annual report, Internet and Jobs. And we also launched yesterday with the UN uh, Tech Envoy, the project CREATE, which is collaborate to realize employment and entrepreneurship potential for all through a technology ecosystem. And uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Digital Health was founded on 8th April this year. And our goal is uh, adoption of digital health across the continuum of care across the world. Two of our uh, founding members, the Digital Health Academy and the Health Parliament, are very active on this. And Digital Health Academy with IM Raipur, which is in country's uh, premier institute on management, has launched a postgraduate program on digital health, which is going live. And we'll also launch a course for frontline health workers across the world, because these are the ones which are the most left behind. Without them, we cannot have digital health across the world. Now, coming to why we are doing uh, this forum, the fact is that responsible internet usage is today a very important topic. And that's why we have taken it at the UNIGF. Because our lives revolve around the internet. I think today it's not a question how many of you don't have a mobile phone, how many of you didn't use internet today. I think in the last one hour, probably everyone around have, would have SMSed, would have sent an email, would have browsed the inter internet, or would have uploaded a photograph on the net. And I'll just give you a sense of what it means as an impact to the environment. So a single text SMS is 0 0.8 grams of carbon emission. A single tweet you do is 0 0.2 grams of carbon emission. If you browse the internet for one minute is 1.1 gram of carbon emission. If you send an email, depending on the size of attachment, it will be between 0 0.3 to 50 grams of carbon emission. And if you have had a Zoom, which we are doing, most of my panelists are joining on Zoom. So it's between 2 to 50 grams of carbon emission. So the fact is that though digitalization is becoming integral to our lives, but the digital footprint has also got a carbon footprint. We're also trying to understand the current life cycle and the way we lead our lives. So taking an average lifespan of 70 years, if we take around eight hours of sleep per day, we probably sleep 24 years in our life. But if you look at the 6.9 hours of time we spend on the web, we have actually almost 21 years of our life on the internet. That means majority of our time, we are actually going to be on the net in terms of our official work hours. And it will have its impact on the carbon uh, footprint, the carbon emissions. And that's why probably if you look at the last year or so, deserts have been having floods and the rain-fed areas have been you know, facing drought. That's one of the impact. So we thought we should actually look at this issue, not from an environment standpoint, but also from the uh, societal peace and cohesiveness standpoint. So this report that we are releasing today, the Responsible Internet Usage Report, and we're going to discuss this also today. And uh, with me today, I have uh, global experts with me, uh, Mr. Gunjan Sina from Palo Alto, who is a tech pioneer, who is an internet pioneer based in Palo Alto, San Francisco is the executive chairman of Matrix Scream. Besides, he chairs and sits on various boards uh, globally. Mr. Pur Dr. Puran Chand Pandey, who is a senior visiting fellow at the uh, Institute for uh, Democracy at Taiwan in Taipei. And besides, he was also on the board of the Nobel Prize winning World Food Program. And he has also served as a former CEO of the Delagon Civilizations. And he serves on various boards. Mr. Dino Cataldo Delasio, I hope I got your name right. He's a chief information officer at the United Nations Joint Staff Pension Fund. He's done amazing work, which is the recipient of the UN Secretary General Award. Dr. Osama Al Hassan, a senior uh, digital health expert who works on smart health at the Dubai Health Authority. 
Uh, my colleague Smithy Loya, who is co-author of the report and also representing Health Parliament and Health Academy here. Doc, Mr. Eric Solom, who couldn't join uh, us here because he's on a flight, he has a last minute change, but he's the former Environment and Development Minister of Norway, former Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, and also sits on several boards across the world. So I'm getting straight to my uh, panel, and first question is, of course, to the tech pioneer Gunjan, who's with us. Gunjan, thanks for joining in. I guess it's uh, midnight at your uh, place. I don't know what to greet you with, but thanks for taking out time. You have seen the growth of internet you know, over the last three decades and being a pioneer. Do you think where we reached is a very responsible usage of the internet? If not, what are the things we should be doing? Over to you. Uh, and uh, I, I do think that, you know, internet has become foundational to our lives, to the society and to the, you know, nations globally. And as you rightly pointed out, Professor Gupta, bulk of our waking life is internet enabled in many, many forms. Uh, so the, with the positives comes a lot of the challenges that the internet itself has posed um, and going beyond just what's obvious to a lot of us you know, it's, it, it has uh, on one hand brought a lot of opportunity, it has also brought a lot of risks and, and downsides. So the environmental social governance of the internet itself is something that has to be thought through very carefully at a policy level, but also at an individual level. And I also think the technologies of the future, there's gonna be a significant intersection of the internet and the ESG principles environmental social governance and let me kind of speak to the concept of in environmental social governance a lot of a lot is being said about that uh, the the three letter acronym of esg uh, but it has to be foundationally be tied with newer technologies which are actually looking at the carbon footprint and the intersection of the digital footprint and how that provides for a better environmental social governance uh, of the internet. The environmental world really focuses on the carbon side. The social kind of focuses on how internet is used for kind of narrowing the digital divide and not accelerating the digital divide. Uh, and that's going to be the, the, the challenge. There are technologies emerging. There are efforts emerging that can actually narrow the, the, the divide and actually focus on a better enhanced environmentally conscious internet uh, and I'll give you just a sample of that in terms of if you look at the recent uh, turmoil, and I'm going to use the social media as an example of what you've seen happen at Twitter, a large number of users have fled Twitter to go to what are called more distributed uh, uh, paradigms of uh, social media as opposed to centralized. I do believe the next generation social media is going to be more decentralized and when you decentralize internet, it actually creates more empowerment and more local governance as opposed, as opposed to the reliance on single large networks like Facebook, Twitter, or whoever else is controlling the social media. So we have to get towards more decentralization, more localization, and more governance, which is at the local levels, even though internet assumes to be a global network. So the beauty of it is as you get to a federated model, you will actually create a lower digital footprint. You will actually you know, build an internet that's more scalable and at the same time more uh, con conscientious in its power consumption, in its digital consumption. And that's how you go to the vision of better governed, better environmentally and socially governed internet of the future. Gunjan, you made a very important uh, point of ESG. I think that should be the uh, mission of everyone who is involved with the internet. 
do you think it is time for us to also draw a framework for self regulation you know as a part of esg for everyone who is involved given that's going to be federated now yeah and i think that is exactly you know where it goes so you if you go away from the world of what i call massively centralized internet that we have seen rise of mega you know empires like amazon or google or facebook and and i have nothing against those platforms they are amazing they have they serve a critical function uh, but as you go towards localization and when you actually decentralize and get to more federated architectures of the internet of the future and then to take it to your point uh, professor gupta as you start to take the localization to the next extreme where you take it down to what i would call personalization where at individual level you create self regulation and governance and tools that shows you metrics of your usage just like you know you see when you go buy a carton of milk you can see the calories you consume you see the fat you see the protein you regulate your behavior today i have no standardization there isn't a standard body that says that every tweet i make you know here's my carbon emission and i think those kinds of common vocabulary and taxonomy at a personalized level has to be boxed in just like you see it on food product labeling and other things so i see an intersection of public policy uh, taxonomy standardization and common vocabulary and a shift towards more localization and personalization as opposed to global uh, centralization that has been the norm so far on the internet evolution thanks gunjan a very good action point that you have laid out which i am sure will feed into our sessions action and key takeaways now based on what gunjan has been talking about esg dino you have been doing fantastic work at your organization which has also been you know um, saving the carbon impact on the work that is being done uh, and you have been also recipient of the award would you like to share what are your views on responsible internet usage and how organization should be you know taking a cue and acting on that Thank you very much, Professor Gupta, and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, indeed, um, the experience of the United Nations Joint Staff Pension Fund uh, was exactly uh, based on an analysis of how technology could have improved the organization uh, in uh, uh, making something that uh, for 70 years had been conducted uh, on a paper base into uh, a technological manner. So we indeed apply the concept of uh, digital transformation in digitalizing something that uh, involved manual intervention, that involved the use of postal services, that required the use of printing, paper, archiving, and storage. So in so doing, what we did, uh, we first and foremost, uh, looked at the process itself. And the process helped us identify the key element of, uh, of the new uh, solution, which in our case was based on the creation of a digital identity. By creating a digital identity, we were finally able to have an interlocutor, to have a counterpart that was reliable. If by having that level of reliability, we were able to design around that in a digital identity a process that by using the internet allow us, enable us to uh, achieve economy and to achieve value. Economy in the sense that we actually went live with this application during the pandemic period. For example, in and Romania, uh we have, like you're saying, a back to normal. Uh, we use a lot in the pandemic and COVID, uh, the tele <coughs> telemedicine. <coughs> but now, let's say everyone is back into normal. That meaning also the doctors don't accept it yeah. to, to have a telemedicine. But for my opinion, it's back to normal. Excuse me? It's, no <coughs> it's not okay. But uh, many private sector, the good thing that they are still working on digitalization. Sorry, just one moment. There is an, an overlap in our audio they system. They are working on digitalization, but meaning they are making more software, making more access for the, uh, their patients, and uh, they are working good in that direction. It's my opinion. Uh, I can adapt probably from um, the European perspective. Um, 
indeed, we have seen a super rapid. Perfect, thank you. So apologies, there was an interference that it was just resolved. So um, I, I was uh, describing the um, savings that uh, we were able to achieve through the implementation of uh, a solution based on digital identity. The savings were even uh, more obvious and evident in our case since the fact that uh, we went live just before the pandemic hit the globe. And uh, in our case, we really uh, appreciated the, the value of having a technological solution for individuals that were distributed, and we are talking about more than 80,000 people in 193 countries, that finally they, notwithstanding the limitation and the constraints that uh, uh, occur as, uh, as a result of the pandemic, they were still able to conduct their process and to certify, in our case, vis-a-vis -vis the digital identity solution, that they were still alive because our system, our solution was intended to provide a proof of existence, proof of identity, proof of transaction, and proof of location. And just one last comment. Um, today, we, when we are talking, when we're referring, as my uh, previous uh, call panelist uh, indicated, when we're talking uh, about Web 3.0, we are talking about Internet of Value. And this concept of value is being uh, referred to the fact that uh, using the internet technology and, and using the new application that have been developed on top of it, we are able to exchange value directly without the use of intermediaries. But I think that uh, this concept of value should be revisited and not seen only about the ability to transfer value, to transfer asset, but also about how we can make this transfer happen and what are the implications, as was alluded to before, from the point of view of the cost and from the point of view of the benefit? Thank you. Excellent, Dinu. And I think you have uh, been able to implement, which is uh, one of the recommendations that we need to reduce our carbon footprint using technology. Uh, I have a message that Eric Solem sent because he had to change here to be on board of flight. I'm going to read out that. According to Eric, this is his message at the IGF panel. The IT industry has a double responsibility for contributing to solving our global environment crisis. The industry should aim to get net zero, sourcing its data centers from renewable energies and buying carbon credits for emissions which cannot be abated. He further adds, it should be its use its enormous outreach on the variety of social media platform to facilitate a broad dialogue on how we solve environmental problems. So very clearly, uh, Eric has put out that while one side we need to address the carbon impact, I think the point that Gunjan raised about the societal impact is something also we should discuss with the panelists and also with the people in the room. And now I move to Dr. Osama Al Hassan, who has joined us from the Dubai Health Authority. Uh, Osama, you know that uh, while we keep spending time on the net using devices, the health hazards, which are physical and mental, are aggravating. What would you like to share here, and how do we mitigate the risks that come associated with using digital technologies? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Gupta. There is no doubt that there is uh, a lot of studies that uh, correlate or associate the excessive use of internet and uh, related devices to the health of people and uh, these consequences are normally either psychological or, or, or in well-being or even when physical health uh, so these uh, consequences ca can vary from different perspectives but i would like to focus more on two groups of i can say internet users because their excessive use of internet will last for, for, for so many years and it will affect their psychological and physical abilities for, for so many years, which will cause damage to the economy, to their health, to their families. So one example for that is uh, when we talk about the, 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 the clear physical uh, pains that people will have normally, like less pain, uh, back pain, for example, uh, even we see that these days that even 
there, there's some sort of anomalies on the postures of peop uh, young people because of, of their sitting into with the, uh, in the internet for so long or for using the mobile for so long. So th this will affect also their sights and their, 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 their cognitive abilities. So these, these are very important issues. Uh, when we talk about the uh, also one of the key e health issues that now are clearly associated with the excessive internet use is the high blood pressure and obesity for or obesity for sure. Uh, you know, sitting for so long uh, or focusing on on internet devices for so long, especially with people who are even addicted to gaming, for example. This for sure will will uh, impact their uh, blood pressure, and they will have high blood pressure for so long. Even if they will try to treat it, it will be very difficult, especially at early ages. So th this is very clear. Uh, when we go to the psychological side, so we see uh, anxiety is becoming more and more uh, prevalence. Uh, we see that especially with children, with adolescents that now they have more dif uh, even difficulties with 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 uh, interacting with the real world and that's that's becoming a very big issue now for people who want to uh, be independent and inter interact with the, with the, with the, their society so they can have a, a good job or a good training or good education all these requires uh, abilities to interact uh, in, a, in a better way with with your surrounding focusing so much on the internet and internet uh, related uh, devices will for sure diminish or at least minimize these abilities so this is this area that is a lot of uh, uh, consideration and there, we, we need to have a lot of governance issues around it uh, these governance issues should be applied even to the internet the, uh, or the internet based uh, uh, i can say companies or businesses that they need to have some sort of a cap on on personalized activities related to their applications, for example. I think maybe a good example for that uh, kind of a governance that we have on the global level, uh, uh, and this could be also related as well to, to, to the usage of internet. Uh, there is a, a, an organization called Health on the Net, for example, that was specifically used to govern the, 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 the contents around healthcare in, 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 web, in, the web, in websites or in the internet. So it was an independent uh, authority or organization that looks into the data, any data that was put in the internet around, for example, diseases or treatment or whatever. And the most important factors that they touch that they will bring to the internet, uh, dependable data, uh, uh, data that has uh, kind of uh, re research evidence, that, that when people consume it, when they say research, searches for their health problems, whatever, they will go to a confident place, they will get confident data that they can rely on. So I think we have we have to have certain authorities or certain organizations at the global level that looks even into the, the interaction that particularly those groups, children and uh, adolescents, uh, and how they can govern their interaction with their, whether they are games or they are social media application or whatever. Uh, another part that I also I want to uh, tackle, which is also around responsible uh, use of, of uh, internet, is we need to have some legal governance also around misbehaviors like bullying, for example, or shaming or cursing. This could be at the low global level, at the regional level, and even at the country level. We need to have a framework to make sure that the, these kind of interaction will not uh, psychologically impact users. So thank you very much. So, Osama, sometimes, uh, you know, what happens is it's very confusing when you see the way this domain is evolving. And I would still say that despite three decades of internet. I think on our panel, at least Gunjan seems to be one of those who have been very early years on this, is like, there has been like, uh, you know, very confusing signals at time. And I'll give you an example specific with health. 2018, ICT-11 made gaming a disorder. You know, it actually listed gaming as a disorder. In 2020, US FDA 
actually used gaming to treat a disorder called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, is there an oversight besides, you know, self-regulation that we need so that people do not have misinformation or they understand that this domain is evolving pretty fast? What could have been a disorder two years back is actually used for treating a disorder. So is there an initiative in your, uh, you know, knowledge that you want to share with us or is there something in the thought process? Is this question for me? Yes, Osama, that's for you. Yes, uh, as I said, I don't see any, he said, uh, as per my knowledge, I haven't seen any kind of activities in this direction. And because of that, I said that uh, maybe following the step of, of health on the net would be an appropriate approach to tackle these kind of issues. Thank you. Uh, Smriti, you have been, uh, you know, involved in this report and, you know, we know that people are spending almost one third of their life on the internet. So what's your view on responsible internet usage? Hi, everyone. Uh, firstly, it's an honor to be at this conference. And uh, it's uh, indeed a privilege to speak at this platform. And I thank Dr. Gupta for giving me this opportunity to speak and to work on this document. You know, um, as I work on this document, as we all know, like internet has uh, done so much positives in our lives. Uh, communication has become easier. It has given a lot of job opportunities to us. But this is something that is in front of us, right? But at the back end, there's something happening. It is negatively impacting us and the environment. So uh, just tell me how many of you, when you go to sleep, how many of you switch off your Wi-Fi? No one. Okay. That's why uh, data is very scary. Um, so when any invention happens, uh, you know, when internet was coming up, uh, did we, like, we talked about its positives. Did we talk about its negative? Did we map its journey till today? Did we do that? I don't know if we did that or not. But the point here is 20 years down the line, we should not be saying the same thing. That, oh, we didn't know uh, it was impacting us, uh, like negatively impacting us or the environment. Oh, we didn't know uh, that we had to responsibly act. So, like, I sincerely believe that uh, at every step, we should uh, know our responsibility towards uh, our environment and the planet. And today, people, uh, and I emphasize youngsters, like people of my generation, and I'm not talking about people before <laughs> my generation. So people are getting concerned about environment. Um, and uh, they are talking about its co uh, like environmental issues, like climate change. And they are talking about its uh, causes, like, uh, for example, uh, emissions generated by vehicles, factories, we are cutting down forests and etc. But we are not talking about one thing. We are not focusing on one thing that is our digital carbon footprint. Right? Uh, so, like, the extent to which internet has taken over our lives, uh, we are not realizing that how it is impacting us and the environment. And globally, the number has increased, like from millions in early part of the century, to billions in today. And the number is not increasing like year by year. The number is increasing day by day, right? And soon internet is going to become a basic uh, human necessity. So in this report, we have uh, like talked about all this. We have recommended some actions, how to responsibly act. And uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, the point is, the moot question is that do we really know our responsible internet usage? And even if we do know, do we really implement that? Thank you. Thanks, Smriti. Very important point that we need to be cautious of what we do and what's the impact on others, what's the impact on our lives, our bodies, our society as well. So this brings me to Dr. Puran, whom I have known, and he has worked in different sectors and uh, fairly involved in the future of how net will impact uh, through economy, you know, what he's 
currently working on. So Dr. Puran, I mean, would you like to share your perspective on responsible internet usage given that we are all moving online, our education, our jobs, and uh, what we can do about being responsible? Thank you very much indeed, and I'm very thankful for being invited to contribute some of my thoughts on this very, very important topic. Let me pick up uh, from where you started. I mean, our daily lives, uh, we end up using technology, whether we want to or we do not really want to use it. Because there are systems and architects and what we do, uh, there is a natural embedding of technology uh, that we have to usually use. Uh, and this could probably range from using the phone to using the laptop, to sending text, and to also sort of entertain ourselves as and when we can. And therefore, the whole element of technology becomes important not only in a standalone fashion, but it gives dimensions to various intersectoral activities, which usually going on to merge and mix in ways that sometimes we don't even realize that we are passing through technology, which is both intrusive and non-intrusive. In some cases, we know what we are doing. In some cases, we suffer with dopamine, which creates a lot of pleasure of how we use internet and technology. That is one of the serious problems of any technology when we really go beyond and begin to really use it without really knowing the consequences that we are going to have, both on health, also on climate, also on society, and also on how we end up destroying uh, ourselves. And uh, one of the panelists uh, prior talked about sitting, postures, uh, how it happens, how we use it. And many a times we're not really aware of the consequences which we are really uh, passing on to ourselves, to society, to environment, to uh, CO2 emissions, and so on and so on forth. So let me uh, give a brief pressy of the kind of the scale and impact that we end up creating by doing very, very small, small things in our lives. If we were to really look at uh, one MB uh, email size, which produces roughly about 20 gram of CO2 in its life cycle, which is equivalent to lighting a 60 watt old, I mean, old bulb, uh, which is burning for about uh, uh, 35 minutes. One MB, and you could probably then calculate the scale and impact when we really cover about 60, 65% of the humanity uh, using technology. So we are 8 billion. So let's put 60% of it, a fairly sizable number of people using one uh, MB uh, email, which if you really collect and collate, you could very easily imagine the kind of scale and impact of, of CO2 footprint that we are creating out of the technology uses only by using one MB of email. Uh, so this is a very small example, but I think that suffices uh, to um, um, highlight uh, the kind of uh, uh, activities uh, that we undertake without knowing what it does. And therefore, knowledge is something which I have always felt is very, very important because many of us, and majority of us, will not really know the kind of impact which one MB of an email uh, data will probably create in its life cycle, uh, which is about 20 gram. And just add it up and you will probably get a better sense of scale and impact. Now let me move forward. And you open by saying, uh, we send a text, we write the email, uh, we entertain ourselves on mobile, we use a lot of data, and therefore if we were to really look at what is really happening on an aggregate level, we as each one of us, we have been probably contributing more than 300 million tons of CO2 annually, uh, which goes from sending email to text to what we do on 
internet and how we play games and um, do a whole lot of things which we're not really aware in terms of the kind of impact, negative impact that we are really creating, both for the people around us and also on the environment, which is an intrinsic part of our life. And if we don't really take care of it, then God only could really save us. Let me now come pretty quickly to a few research studies which are uh, already ongoing in Harvard, uh, which has been experimenting uh, with uh, people who are um, rendered uh, mental and uh, how these people have been render, rendered mental by excessive use of technology and how could they be better rehabilitated. And this is where the whole area that you have been handling, the health, it comes into an interplay. And therefore technology is not only technology that we use and how we use, but how do we really intersect it at uh, the cusp of health, at the cusp of mental disorder, at the cusp of environment and climate change and our own individual responsible behavior, which is very, very important. And I really attribute it to a very large extent to the absence of knowledge and not enough being told to many of our kids because we still are better off because we began to use technology and internet when we were probably you know 30 years old. But what is really happening now is a child uh, sitting in the pram, parents giving a handset and this child is only watching something, maybe a Ludo game or some um, comic uh, film. Uh, I mean, that is really going to be pretty messy and uh, not too far away from now, because when these kids grow by the time they're 30, by which time we started using the internet and technology, these guys will be half gone. So we have got to really consider the following. The first thing is that we have got to educate our children uh, right from the school. Uh, that look, I mean, these are the kind of good things, but you have got to be pretty careful in terms of how. It is how which is more important, not what we have. It is very, very important that we tell them. Second thing, it is very important that companies which are producing technology need to really come out and not only through an ESG. The ESG has been, uh, you know, a very... Uh, truncated kind of an idea. But what really needs to happen to begin with is that they need to really report in terms of what they're doing, in terms of their sustainability report, in terms of how do they really embed the value that they have been creating, not only by selling technology, but also being aware of how could they really make people uh, uh, more uh, in the state of well-being. And the third thing which I personally believe is, and I have been the part of COP, 26 last year in Glasgow and this year as well. There is a big talk now through the COP, COPs, uh, both 26 and 27, but how will technology uh, either enable what we have been doing as human beings or how will it really disable us in terms of the kind of overall progress that we will miss out on achieving because we are too deep and too deeply embedded with what we have been doing with technology. And therefore there's a call to action by the UN and since I have been a part of the UN myself, which I headed in Delhi, uh, two things are happening. One, that the UN has been asking companies through ITU to cut on their emissions by 50% by 2030, uh, while the companies will be contributing roughly about 14% of CO2 by 2040. And finally, I would really like to say the following, that Technology is very, very helpful. And this is what we were talking yesterday as well. I could not really complete, but we have got to be very much aware of how technology could spoil the whole game and begin to create people who might not be able to uh, remain conscious of their own personal health, their own personal care. And then on top of it all, they will continue to contribute to carbon footprint, which is only going to take a very fresh breath of air out of our uh, society, uh, air, our um, greenery, our um, biodiversity, and so on and so forth. And therefore, on the one hand, 
individual responsibility is very, very important. But I think an equal pressure on companies need to be put on where the need to probably use more renewable energy. Uh, even today, as we are talking about uh, technology, uh, more than 80% of technology producers are working with fossil fuel. How do they really transition to green and clean um, energy? And that could be the saver, not the solution, but we need to be very much careful and very much aware about how we do what we have been doing. Therefore, we can use technology not as a master, but as a slave, because the moment technology becomes a master, human beings are really going to perish, not uh, so far away from now. So I'll pause here and be happy to answer any other question, which might come from you or from the audience. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Puran. I think very important points you raised and we all have been witnessing the parenting part for sure, you know, where the kids are given mobile to have their meals on time, to be busy with their own self, not disturb. But this is creating in them in their formative years a psyche where they will not be able to stay away from, you know, the mobiles. You also made a point about knowledge being available and small things mattering big, you know, our small steps. So in our offices, we switch off the Wi-Fi the moment we leave. We leave, switch off the Wi-Fi in our office at homes when it's not in use. But I don't know if everyone does, as Smithy asks everyone. It is very difficult. It's become a part of our lives, you know, where we think it's on, there's nothing going on. So if you look at this report, it's just a 10-page report. It will be available on the web of IGF. We have put some checklist of the things you do. There are apps on your mobile phones that are actually working in the background, consuming still data. And there are 7.2 million data centers across the world. And some of the data centers' carbon emissions are more than countries combined. So small things do matter. I think Dr. Pandey made a very important point. But he also ended by saying that companies have a big role to play. And uh, Gunjan, we couldn't have you yesterday somehow for a time mismatch. But a very important point that is being understood by people is that what essentially technology is doing is shifting the power from the governments to private sector. And I'll give you a perspective on this. The market cap of big five tech companies is equivalent to the GDP of 157 nations. So in fact, corporations are now powerful than nations. Now, given that you are the only person whom I know, you know, who has been a pioneer in the internet space, founded search engines, you know, much earlier than we know of Google. Now, the vision with which you saw the internet at that time, has it really realized that potential in terms of delivering what it's supposed to? And secondly, that is industry responsible? One of the things that came out yesterday in our sustainable auto automation session was that profit at any cost doesn't have the business model, which effectively means we are screwing up the environment and look up for the profit. So is the industry being responsible and is ESG enough? Or what would be your checklist for the industry, you know, to be more responsible to reduce the inequities which have sprung up? Over to you, Gunjan. No, thank you. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, and this is clearly a topic that is very near and dear to me. You know, having seen the internet and the promise of the internet from the early days, uh, what was supposed to be a network that would actually, you know, bring kind of opportunities to all and actually narrow the digital divide, it has actually accelerated the divide in many ways, as you would see, as you noted, right? Five or six corporations now you know are bigger than 150 nations put together in its uh, overall value so i believe that you know one of the things that we have to look at and uh, and we have to draw a parallel from how things have worked in some other industries so when i look at the healthcare you know and especially in drugs and food there has been a very specific focus to actually have proper labeling and labeling is an important concept if you think about it you know you know you can go to a grocery store you can buy something and you can see what you consume and it's properly labeled when you get into the digital world there is no labeling and the labeling standards have to come out so that it is not very hard for me to at the bottom of the email to be able to see a label that what impact does an email have and if that is becomes a standard regulation 
then I know that, you know, when I drink a cup of milk, I know how much calories am I consuming or what protein I'm getting. Or if I take a drug, there are specific regulations on labeling. The similar concept from the digital health has to now move into the internet. So we have to label our digital activity properly because as you label those, it starts to create awareness. That awareness leads to the right change of behavior, which then leads to a more ESG uh, centric uh, uh, internet. And I think that is the part which I think has been missing in our, uh, in our overall architecture of the internet of the future. So it requires governments to come together, it requires standard bodies like you know, what we are talking about in this forum to come together to create the labeling standard. What FDA has done in US, for example, we can chapter, take a chapter of that book and apply that into the digital uh, internet of the future. So uh, I would leave that thought because I've been thinking about it and I feel like this is long overdue and has to be taken out as an initiative, you know, with urgency. Very important action point and I think this can have a profound impact on our generation and generations to come and I think the team at Health Parliament which is watching this should actually work on this uh, standards. I think like all the cell phones have that screen time, you know, notification, you can see them that your screen time this week is either more or less than last week or month and so on and so forth. Same way, I think we could actually quantify that as the carbon footprint. And if we draw out like what you call the average lifespan based on your usage, you know, of the longevity like this could be your impact on footprint could lead to warming by this degrees. I think all of us would be conscious enough to say, no, we don't want to leave a planet, which is for mass extinction. I think this is a very important point you have brought out. And this, the current things that we are seeing today is when 2.7 billion people are not connected to the internet and metaverse is still in the works. Once we have our digital twins, I am not sure how much impact we can have and probably this is the right time to trigger a debate and to come out with certain things and I think at this time I'll pass on to Dino to talk about the importance of sharing best practices and guide, creating guidelines for this. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gupta. Yes, I believe this is a perfect segue to what uh, uh, the previous panelists had just mentioned. Uh, personally, uh, most of my career uh, at the UN was in auditing. I was responsible for the Office of Internal Audit of the United Nations for 10 years. And uh, in 2017, when I became Chief Information Officer and I started this uh, project of digital identity, and deploy the solution that make use of new technologies, such as biometrics and the blockchain. One of the first questions from myself, uh, given my background, is now that uh, I, have, I have implemented a system using new technologies, how can I provide assurance about the reliance of these technologies to my governing bodies, to the oversight bodies, to the stakeholders at large? And here I believe, as uh, the distinguished panelists before me alluded to, I don't think that uh, we are mature yet in having a set of standards, a set of indicators, of best practices to provide that level of assurance. I think technologies, new technologies such as uh, facial recognition and biometrics, so such as blockchain, do not yet have generally accepted criteria, a standard that can be used, for example, to provide the labeling that was alluded to before by the previous speaker. So I think a lot still needs to be done in order to make sure that who's going to use this technology can do that in an accountable manner in order to provide criteria in order to provide assurance about whether and how one of these technology it's used, this is being done by taking into consideration all the important implication of each one of these technologies. Whether it is about environmental sustainability, whether it's about social responsibility, whether it's about energy consumption, and so forth. So I believe this is definitely a, a, an area where more collaboration should come in between all parties, whether government, international organization, private sector, professional association, working together and create a start, creating a set of standard in order to provide assurance and reliance on the responsible use of these technologies. Thank you. Yeah. 
Gunjan, do you want to make a point here? Yeah. Go ahead. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, I feel like, you know, uh, the standard uh, that was alluded to here, and is, that's exactly what I mean by the labeling. The interesting thing is that the technology, if you look at the internet, you look at the HTTP protocol, you look at the web protocols, they are very easily taggable. You can tag things. You can create a common taxonomy, a vocabulary, a standard. And I think the organization that will be most effective in doing is something which is transnational, something that looks at it globally, but has a bent to look at things regionally and locally as such and understand the geographical difference as independent of nations and definitely independent of the mega corporations which are controlling much of the you know, internet power. So uh, UN was in a great position to be able to take spearhead an initiative to create a standard and embed that standard into the HTTP protocol and, and the browsers and the technologies of the future, the social media, I think they will be in a very good place to adopt it because as consumers would embrace the labeling that this brings out, it will start to change consumer behavior. Today, we do not have, you know, yes, we get notifications about our usage, but we don't have a labeling just like what you see in the drug industry, just like the way you see in the food industry. And those are creating change behavior. So we have to take the regulations and standards and apply that and have the companies be held accountable to quality of the digital world as such, just like we care about the quality of what we see in the world of food and drug and uh, healthcare we need to raise the quality of the digital footprint to the next level. Thanks, Gunjan. I think as the United Nations Internet Governance Forum, you know, as a key body on internet issues for the UN, we will take this up and hopefully, you know, uh, we'll reach out to you over the next uh, few weeks to, you know, get a formal uh, shape to what this framework should look like. I know you have been uh, championing data philanthropy and other initiatives, and I hope we will get your support on this. And now, Moving this to the next level, I was looking at the data. We look, we do our annual report called Internet and Jobs. I was looking at the current ongoing study that we are doing called Internet and Jobs 2022. So we also asked one of the questions like, how many hours do you spend on the internet? So the last part, 10 plus hours on per daily basis, the number is 20%. So one out of five actually spend more than 10 hours on the internet. And if you really look at the data of how many photos get uploaded on Snapchat, on Facebook, on WhatsApp, Insta is 14.1 billion. 14.1 billion photographs a day. And if I look at people spending time, average of 6.9 hours on the internet. And I think Smriti alluded to the fact that, you know, the younger generation, I think today older generation are spending more time probably. We need to study that as well. So they, we call them younger adults. So Smriti, given the fact that you have said that we need to be more conscious of how we approach our uh, usage of the internet. Do you think like we do intermittent fasting for health, we should do plan internet fasting for uh, planetary health? And also now we have four days a week coming up. Should we also do an internet holiday two day a week? Will it be feasible for the younger generation to consider that? Or maybe time to draw, as Dino said, standards, guidelines. And I think as Gunjan said that we need to come out with frameworks of the labeling or the standards embedding an IP protocol. Do you think you need to come out with the internet etiquette for people like what it means and how we do we use internet on a daily basis? I, I certainly think that um, internet etiquettes, we should come up with a, a report of internet etiquettes. I think, um, as you said, regarding youth, I think uh, we um, what we need to consider that uh, like on internet, while using internet that what's necessary and what's not necessary like what necessary stuff we are doing and what not what unnecessary stuff we are doing on internet right so we need to consider like what are the for what purposes we are using internet so like we need to see what uh, kind of platforms we are using what kind of uh, content we are accessing and suppose for example uh, we are talking about internet etiquettes like um um uh, for example, there is a lot of uh, fake news, fake information is out there, right? So um, if I, uh, you know, access an information blindly, I what I'll do, I'll go 
and I spread that information, right? So uh, what if that uh, information is uh, fake information, disinformation? I am again spreading it and I am again, um, I mean, uh, contributing to digital carbon footprint. So at that minute level, we need to consider our responsibility. So yeah. <coughs> And just Smriti, you made that important point of how we get carried by the things that are there and how we contribute to it. And I remember last year I wrote a paper with the Center for International Relations, which is a Poland-based European think tank. It was about democracy in the age of social media. And I'll bring this point, and I think Gunjan has also highlighted, Dino also you know, touched upon that, and Mr. Pandey also touched that. See, earlier what happened, democracy as an institution was created hundreds of years ago where you saw a leader working and then you actually voted them or elected them. Now in the age of social media, which is, I would call it internet, so there was that age when democracy was created for servant leadership. You actually saw them working, you elected them. Now what has happened is you get bombarded by messages and I'm alluding this for the fact that we are still having an angle of responsible internet usage. So someone whom you don't know is now parachuted into the age with too many messages coming, creating a positive image, you elect that. So servant leadership has become celebrity leadership in the age of social media. Whether democracy was made for this age, we don't know. I mean, that's a very different dimension of responsibility on the internet. But I would ask each of my panelists if they wish to comment on this, starting with Gunjan. Yeah. No, and, and I think, you know, you raise a good point here. I, I think uh, what social media, digital media is doing is, you know, as you said, there's a lot of way for people to propel themselves and get into the center of attention, which is completely an antithesis to, you know, the paradigm of servant leadership, where the role is focused much more on supporting and being the force to help drive change and support your team, support the society and, or your organization. And when you get into the world where celebrity notions become more important than the agenda, the passion, the impact, I think you start to see the wrong behaviors. And I think we have to change the role model and we have to celebrate people who are behind the scene as much as people who are in the scene or in the social media. And I think this is part of the problem of the new media is that it accelerates what I call more celebrity worship. Uh, and we are not able to distinguish between fact and fiction. Uh, and it leads to more responsibility for those people who are in celebrity position to be more responsible. But it also means that we have to bring out stories which illustrate the power of servant leadership, illustrate the power of true uh, people who are behind the scene doing real work and not just people who are in the limelight. Thanks, Gunjan. Dino, would you like to add to this? Thank you. Definitely. I, I think, especially looking at the outcome of this uh, excellent uh, report that uh, was uh, produced on the responsible internet usage, and again, using the hat, my previous hat of internal auditor, one of the main principles of auditing is that you cannot manage what you don't measure. And two is that you cannot responsibly govern when you don't know the risk. So uh, I think this uh, report uh, highlights exactly the key component of these two concepts. One, it tries to quantify, tries to measure what is the impact of using these the new technologies? And two, what are the risks? So I think with these two very meaningful input, we can now start creating on top of this, for example, risk assessment criteria and provide organization that intend, that plan to make use of this technology to conduct an analysis and be aware of what are the costs the benefits and the risk of engaging or adopting and implementing this kind of technologies in their internal processes. So while, of, of course, we will never be able to mitigate all the risk, 
but at least uh, we can start demonstrating that uh, we try to be accountable and responsible on the user of this technology by uh, first and foremost identifying the risk and where it's possible trying to mitigate those risks. Thank you. Thanks, Dinu. Osama, your view? Osama, are you online? Okay. Uh, I don't think we are able to have him. So, Smriti, your view on this? So, I think um, there are two parts of the internet, like uh, two sides of the internet. Like, first is uh, the influence uh, it generates, and second, how we receive the information. Uh, like, and for what for what uh, purpose we are accessing it dr pandey your views on this i think i have only two things to say one is about democracy and how democracy intersects wrongly or rightly with internet usage which could probably mean right from emailing to being on social media on LinkedIn and so on and so forth. There has been a tendency, and since I've been now uh, working on this whole notion of how technology intersects with democracy, and how does that really take us into the post-truth era? That is one of the most critical uh, things which technology is really going to do, which will mean that many of our leaders in democracy, the moment they survive, three times, four times, five times, then the only thing to perpetuate the leadership and getting back to power is to a very large degree driven by how you project yourself. So there is nothing like servant or leader. It is all about taking people in any democracy in the post-truth era, which will mean that even while you're not doing anything as a leader, you will try and use the media or the technology in such a way that you take democracy to a point when it becomes populism. So that is the one thing and one crisis which we are seeing ac across the world, mostly in Africa, uh, fairly uh, deep influence in Asia, and that is also playing out in a different way altogether in transatlantic. So that is the kind of downside that technology will bring in whereby it will really put people in post-truth era and they will be doing things which is going to be told to them will happen five years down the line, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line and not now. The second part before I came for this uh, discussion, I quickly went through the sustainability report of Google and Facebook. They both mentioned, unfortunately, that uh, the usage um, of technology by an individual is about 229 kilograms CO2 equivalent of uh, CO2. So therefore, the first thing is before we go into applied notion and concept of how companies need to behave and conduct themselves, it will be a very good idea to sort of put some kind of incentive through regulation and also probably tell them that, look, whatever you have been doing, you need to at least begin to report through your sustainability compliance reports in terms of what you have been doing and what is uh, really needed to be done because it is not only what somebody has done, but there has to be a pathway for companies in order to what they will do over five years, seven years, 10 years, and 20 years. And finally, I'm a great believer of the knowledge that we have how do we really leverage that knowledge to educate for that knowledge to sink in deeper in the younger generation? And I think more than checklist or anything else, it will be a very good idea to figure out as to how could NGO, civil society, including the governments could reach out to schools, colleges, because I can see a very distinct possibility of uh, counseling centers being opened not far away from now, but in about five to seven years, where people would be treated or they will need the treatment for getting over with a post-truth uh, scenario that they will 
that they will get into with excessive use of technology. So I think schools, colleges, uh, parenting, companies, and then the governments will really need to be very careful in terms of what they do on how they project what they've been doing and uh, not really fall off the cliff from being a democratic setup to that of being a populist setup altogether. So not really be a regime, but be a system. Uh, technology should really help us freeze there and not really take the wind out of us. Thank you. I think this is such a engaging discussion on a topic. I think we have still not scratched the surface of the internet or technologies, but we are still seeing the impact. I mean, this brings me and Dr. Pandey has in every uh, intervention talked about knowledge and I will bring to you one interesting uh, theory called the Buckmaster Feller curve. I don't know if you are aware about it. The rate of doubling of information has increased to such an extent that around the 1500 issue happen in once in 500 years. Then it became 250, then it became 100 years, then it became 50, 25. In 2021, it was 12 hours. Every 12 hours, we were doubling information. But despite having so much of information, I think we have not become, I would not even call it knowledgeable. If we are knowledgeable, we're not even wise enough because we are seeing kind of conflicts that are happening, the way degradation of the planet is happening. And this is being said, I think Gunjan also made this point. And uh, Dr. Pandey highlighted about 250 kilograms of carbon emission per individual. I think we are shooting beyond our weight in terms of carbon for sure. And if they say there is nothing free, either you are the product. My worry is not about we being the product. My worry is planet being the victim of being the product. And where we are, we are heading it, we don't know. At this time, I would think as a panel, we would stop talking. But we would like to hear from the audience on this topic of being responsible towards humanity for using internet. And even people who are online and offline in the room, please shoot your questions and let's also learn what your perspective are on this issue. Okay, there's a question in the room. Um, thank you very much for this um, very exciting uh, and illuminating um, discussion. Uh, I have two uh, comments. Uh, one is that uh, I think we have focused more on the uh, general and global impact and the effects. Um, I haven't had um, discussion around issue of uh, digital dementia um, because we have become so scrumped to technology that we are not able to remember things, you know. We trust that any information that we have, uh, we would have to kick on our handsets to help us remember. Um, we do, now don't care about spelling words. We trust that the computer would help us to do so. And we also lose our sense of uh, grammar because uh, computers would always do that. So I, I think that is leading to a uh, loss of analytical skills among the people. And I think this is something that is very difficult to quantify and therefore perhaps not so visible as the issue of carbon uh, emission and so forth. My other point is that I think we have to be a little bit careful about generalizing um, propositions. Uh, I come from Africa. I know that the majority of Africans are digitally excluded and therefore they, they have no access to the technology, the devices for them to even be addicted. Uh, right now, I think our concern is how do we ensure that the vast majority of Africans are digitally uh, included. Now, if we focus the discussion, which is very good, that uh, we are creating um, uh, environmental uh, sustainability challenges, um, exclusively on that without um, uh, drawing attention to the need that um, people actually have a very, very critical need for digital um, access. We would uh, fall into uh, the hands of unaccountable governments in uh, developing countries who will now say, okay, uh, because uh, there's so much concern about uh, carbon emission, we don't have to do much about including our population. I think we will be saving them 
I will be contributing to addressing the carbon print and so forth. So, uh, you know, so, so that that uh, sort of uh, narrative could actually further deepen the digital marginalization of certain people uh, in the uh, global south. Thank you very much. I think very important point you make, sir, and I promise you will not have digital dementia on your point. Uh, we'll make sure that, you know, this is raised. And I think yesterday in our discussion, it came out, I think it was some other panel that I was on, that in Africa, there is no hardware manufacturing, there's no software. Only thing that is done here is repair and probably reuse. So it's on the other end of the circular economy. Now, my worry for nations like Africa and even mine like India, we are like still not developed. We are developing countries, probably lower middle income developing countries. And if we start putting carbon emissions to such countries and not denominating by per capita, we would be at the wrong end of the political spectrum where people will ask us to limit emissions, so we'll not become developed and we'll be asked to be environmentally responsible. Now that's a very different but an important debate that the policymakers or parliamentarians should engage at the UN level. What's the roadmap for that? Having said that, I totally understand that this is an issue that we cannot generalize either statements or our policy papers. It's a very, very divided world. Yes, I agree on that. Thank you. Any other questions? Or yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentations and the talks that have come through. Uh, I'm very excited to understand that there is effort towards uh, writing something about responsible internet usage. It has been spoken about in various platforms, but there is no scientific documentation that uh, has actually come to enable users to be able to make conscious decisions whenever they are engaging with the internet. So the tools that you are proposing here, I think would be important that uh, they be looked at at all uh, levels of the society, including governments and even civil society. And I think it even breaks down into social and personal lives where parents can now be able to look at it and see there is a criteria in which we must be responsible as we go online. It's encouraged that many people move online for purposes of uh, socioeconomic development. But as we do that, we have to remain conscious that the global warming is here with us. And there's also an, uh, an effort or an input that you can do at individual level and at corporate level. I come from a regulatory entity and we've been educating consumers on responsible internet usage. But we do not have specific tools that we can give them and tell them that operator so and so, you can use this criteria to evaluate yourself and be able to know that out of the mass of communication that you release every day or, release or receive every day, this is the carbon footprint that you cause. So if that's, that tool can come in, including the echo rating or labeling, digital labeling that you've indicated to, I think it will go a long way and help in decision making. So uh, as uh, my other uh, people have uh, recommended, this is a progressive journey. But as we double information, let's also double the effort in terms of responsibility. Because again, we have allowed internet to be a platform for entertainment and for celebrities. Yet internet was actually meant for purpose of rejuvenating our economies. Is it possible that we will now reach a point where we can classify that this is professional use of internet and for those on social or entertainment platforms, this is the responsibility matrix that you need to apply. And perhaps if that uh, cost of posting entertainment stuff could be elevated higher than posting professional work production. Uh, without such a difference, I believe that we will drive purpose clearly to say internet was meant to help the office or the production move this much. Those who want to take it for entertainment, welcome. But then this is your effect on the environment because we cannot all bombard the net, make it poisonous, with information and content that was not meant to really move society to the next front. Yeah, uh, you, you, you talked about the amount that is loaded on Snapchat and all those photos. They could be allowed to continue running, but can we give them a price? Normally in taxing, and I'm glad one of the panelists here is an auditor, when you are doing taxes for a country, there is what we call sin tax. You can still uh, enjoy your drink, but you'll pay slightly more as compared to those who are perhaps producing food. 
they will pay tax, but at a level that is affordable. So I think uh, I like the progress towards this, and I look forward to enjoying the printout that you've done, the report that you've released, and, and uh, please make it available and let us work together to get this one done. Thank you so much. I think you have a very important message, and I take that, that as the information is doubling, action should also double. And I think we should denominate that by responsibility metrics that Gunjan also alluded to. And below that, we should dominate that by purpose behind that. You should do anything, but it should be with the purpose and it should be responsibility. I think that will help people inculcate that feeling of saying every step I take is either going up or taking me down. I think we should work together. I'll definitely give you this report and it should be on the Dynamic Coalition of Internet and Jobs website at the IGF. Uh, shortly, but really appreciate your inputs and we should work together. Any other questions online, Smithy? Do you have online questions? We still have time. We'll, we'll take questions. We'll take few online questions and we'll get to the room. Yeah. Okay, so we have few questions, so I'll start one by one. Um, as we are moving towards automation and our dependency on internet has increased many bounds, especially in the wake of COVID-19 followed by remote working, how feasible it is to use internet responsibly. Gunjan, I'll pass this to you, the pioneer of the internet. Can you repeat the question for a second, just so I make sure I got it right? Sure, sir. As we are moving towards automation and our dependency on internet has increased many bounds, especially in the wake of COVID-19 followed by remote working, how feasible it is to use internet responsibly? So I think uh, one of the you know big benefits of the internet is that it is facilitating remote work, which is naturally socially distanced by its definition that you can work from anywhere and the mobility creates that. I think the internet has been in many ways, been an enabler for a lot of uh, ways in which we were able to handle the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I think that's the positive side of what the, internet has brought and i think i come back to the the question that you know as we think about automation and ai and machine learning and all the future technologies we have to think about a very important point i think professor gupta touched upon it it is the profit and purpose have to be married together that has to be an important agenda and technologies like ai it's not just to create billions for few people. It should be what I call AI for billions, where AI creates value for billions of people. So, uh, so what has happened in our first version of AI is that it is actually creating an accelerating wealth generation for few corporations and leaving a lot of people behind. I think I see the internet's evolution now in a much more distributed, what I call decentralized architecture in a federated world, and I think that is where some amount of regulation, labeling, and other things have to come into place to be able to orchestrate this decentralization and distributed architecture. And as we do that, I think, you know, the what internet can do in crisis like COVID or other, you know, human health crisis or, or social emergencies, it'll actually be a force multiplier much more than it ever did even in the wake of the COVID crisis. Thanks, Gunjan. I'll just add to that that even as we speak here, it's not that, you know, everything is wrong. You have islands of excellence and you have islands of ignorance. And I'll give you an example, like I think very important point has been raised in that question that how do we, you know, uh, be responsible. So we have examples of corporates, we have examples of countries where after office hours, you're not supposed to send email, read email or even bother to respond. That's an example already. We have corporations which are moving to a four day visa. We don't know how it's going to pan out because we also have seen a corporation saying work 48 hours a week. So you will always have islands of ignorance matching with islands of excellence. What we need to do is what Dino proposed, setting up the best practices. That's one point. And on the automation part, I think very clear, we should not be indiscriminate. We should be discreet. If you just go on uh, indiscriminate automation, then you do not require panelists like us. There would be AI which will tell you a response to everything because the information is anyway doubling after every two to 12 hours. And we won't have people coming all the way to attend the IGF at all. Probably in the next five years, it will be all done digitally. Thank you. Yeah. And, and there's one, one point I would add here, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, 
you know, a lot has been talked about, you know, how we audit, you know, kind of human, how as humans, what we do, right? The risk management, the compliance, the governance, the audit, all of that has been very well, you know, formulated. But we also have to now start thinking about how do we govern AI? Because algorithms can make biases, can make, you know, dis uh, uh, discrimination, can create uh, uh, challenges in the society. You know, uh, if a self-driving car is moving, you know, and an accident happens, you know, who who gets affected? Is the is the driver gets affected, or is the you know how how should, is this, the algorithm designed? Who does it protect? So there are some major societal issues. So we have to come out with a framework to govern, you know, AI itself. And these are you know standards and best practices related questions that I think organizations have to start to address so that corporations and individuals can adopt these things moving forward. Thanks, Gunjan. That makes a solid case for ethical AI. So we'll go one question online, then we'll go to the room for the questions. Next question. Um, how important it is to incorporate environmental digital responsibility in the education system? Is something being done for the same? So anyone from the panel wants to respond? Yeah, I can try to to give an answer, not really from an educational. I'm don't I don't. Although I, I I did have some experience in academics, what we're trying to do, for example, uh, as I mentioned before, vis-a-vis -vis my quest to be able to provide assurance on the use of new technologies. I started partnering with another non-for-profit uh, professional association, and we built a capability maturity model for blockchain usage. It's called the BMM, Blockchain Maturity Model, and this is was done uh, in collaboration with the Government Blockchain Association of Washington, D.C. And so this is, for me, an example of an initial effort to start creating that framework that uh, uh, the previous panelist, Gujan, was alluding to. We try to create a model within which we could include all the aspects that, for example, have been mentioned today and been uh, alluded to in, in the report. So we included 11 elements, such as governance, such as security, such as privacy, such as sustainability. So I think that these kind of tools, if I can call it like that, can help this discussion and can help create awareness in younger generation to be used also in educational curricula in order to provide those criteria that, for example, were alluded to before, to have an holistic appreciation and assessment vis-a-vis -vis the use of these technologies. Thank you. And I will uh, mention one of the initiatives that I did during my stint as advisor to the Health Minister of India. We created a very small booklet. I think we have reached a stage in the age of Twitter where 250 characters define how much time attention span you will get. So this was a very small pictorial booklet meant for school children. It was like a 10 pager with photographs on what are the good habits that you should have. And this was done in coordination with the Ministry of Education, you know, and released. I think that's where every country, we should focus on primary education and let the ministries of health and education work together to, you know, do something locally. Because this could be provincial subject uh, or state subjects rather than at a national level because things widely differ. Uh, with this, I would like to take questions from the room before we wrap in next five minutes. Can you please get the mic over to him? Thank you, sir. Uh, regarding the re responsible internet usage, what I want to ask was that uh, this responsibility by itself, it have, we have to see from many dimensions. This may just reach to the socio-economic, at the same time, the cultural background. So culturally, you see, the society has to be more aware about their responsibility. 
and at the same time, the accountability for what they just did. Now what I want to ask straight was that, how do you just see it, for example, regarding uh, uh, usage of internet? At the same time, there is content are there. Those contents have to be manageable, I mean. So towards that, with the content wise, how do you just see that? The localization means bringing some content that is related to the internet in terms of the cultural aspects, that means that the content have to be more uh, to be viable to the culture of the existing society. What I mean is that, for example, in developing country and developed country, some aspect may be in some part, the norm may not allow those content. In other part, the content may be just, it is allowable. So in that case, how do you just see the, respons the responsible usage of internet in relation with this content management and localization? That is my question. I think you would have very deep insights to ask this question and I would, I would say that look at the culture policy of uh, a few African countries and I, I would credit them. I just had drafted the culture policy for India to adopt and the point that came out is a good learning. I have quoted that country's culture policy and very specific thing has been talked that in the age of internet where people would look at everything in the world and forget their own culture. So the content and other things should be aligned to the local culture. It's a very important point and I think like that country has put, I think it's Zambia probably, I'll get to that name. It's there mentioned in the culture policy, but very happy to you know uh, send you details of that. I think every country, while we need to be globally connected and localized, we should not forget our culture. The moment we forget our culture, our roots to humanity will be gone. So very important, but I'm glad you brought this dimension out. That will also be one of the important dimensions of responsible internet use. And then thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Emmanuel Yada is my name. Um, I'm from Uganda. I work at African Union. Um, me, my, it's a, in form of a suggestion, but uh, still uh, I'll give a, uh, I'll ask a question at the end. Um, internet usage is all about uh, someone's perception. The data he wants to access online, it uh, actually data is open to everyone, depending on the on the kind of internet you're using. If it is my personal data, I can access anything. And also depending on the the data protection law in the country or yeah in the country you are in the morning i had the chance to attend a, a data protection session like improving data protection laws so i think uh if it is in an organization then uh, uh, uh there is uh, those people the technical people can limit what data you have to access whenever you're using their internet but the main issue is uh, when someone is using uh, his own data and then the question is, uh, you know, different countries have uh, different charges on the data bundles. Uh, is there a way that maybe, is there a convention which can maybe uh, govern the data charges in different societies? Thank you. I will let Dino comment if he wants to on that, and then Gunjan, and then finally I will. So, I mean, fr from my point of view, uh, I don't think that there are specific uh, terms and condition on the on the on the usage specific for for this kind of technologies. Although, as I alluded to before, uh, I think.
Yeah, no, I think I would, I would echo the same sentiment here, uh, you know, so uh, when Dino mentioned that, well, you know, we've got to understand this in a much more spherical way, not top down, understand it from all angles, because part of it is, you know, I'm a big believer. And I think I mentioned about, you know, we have to take the concepts of global networks. And now the next wave of it has to be regionalized, more distributed, more federated, and more uh, personalized, so that you know, whether it's, it's the regulations that we create, whether it's the understanding of how we leverage the data. And I think the current internet has become too centralized. You know, the power is sitting with too few corporations who control what ends up happening. And I think it behooves all of us to come up with a, a, a internet architecture and through policies, through regulations and self-regulations, you know, uh, change that paradigm. Thanks, Gunjan. And I will only bring that practical aspects of all of us viewing website. It says essential cookies take other data. We do not know what essential data, what essential cookies they're asking. I mean, this is a 13 page document. No one will bother to, you know, read all that. Can we simplify it to five lines so that people understand what data they are sharing? What will happen to their, you know, what do you call uh, uh, when people start snooping their data or leaking it or selling it? I think we need to get to the user generator consensus of what they want to share, not those five corporations deciding and sitting on forums and telling, I have a 13 page legal document. You'll never understand. You'll not be able to fight, but you share all data yeah. to us. So I think that's the level of simplicity we want. What am I sharing? Which country I'm browsing, which device I am browsing from? What is my age? What is my digital footprint? So they actually get access to all the data. We need to get to that level of simplicity. But I think the last question that you raised is the most important question. That is a very good way to end the session. And I would like each of my panelists to give a 30 second action item they think we should start with. Starting with Gunjan, obviously. Yeah. No, thank you, Professor Gupta. I think you said it right. And I come back to no one understands a 30 page document. It really doesn't take us anywhere. So I go back to let us look at what's already working. You know, when I go to the grocery store, when I buy something, I can see what I'm consuming, how it is impacting me as, you know, as, as a person. When I go to a website, I need to see that. And it needs to be in a simple way. So this is, you know, the carbohydrate, this is the protein, this is, you know, the fat and the content. If I see that, then I decide whether I want to consume a lot of it or I want to consume a little of it or none of it. I think internet needs to get to the same level of simplicity and labeling, and it needs to be top down and consensus based bottom up. We need to create that architecture and the standard for the future generations to get the best out of the internet potential that has not yet been realized. Thanks, Gunjan Dino. Thank you. So from my point of view, really, to, to summarize uh, some of the comments that have been made during this panel, I think that the next step to be very practical should be to make sure that uh, there is an adequate level of inclusion of all the parties, all the stakeholders that should contribute to the building, the development of this generally, let's call it generally accepted criteria for responsible use of internet and create fora where all these parties can come together and agree on simple terms to explain and to provide framework for practical implementation around this subject. This subject. Thank you. Puran, 30 seconds for you. Thank you very much. I have three very quick points. One, the schools are the key. And there are more than a billion plus people studying in the schools and colleges around the world. Can we really educate them about advantages and disadvantages and make them the part of this advocacy so that they become the part of the solution tomorrow? Second thing, we have to incentivize individual uh, behavior. If I somehow get incentivized by some degree of uh, you know, incentive or that could be some kind of pat on the back. Uh, that would probably go a long way to further drive that message down to uh, last single person in my uh, home, in my society, in my community. And finally, I would really like to see some kind of, of a broad-based 
regulation. Uh, it could be either in terms of taxes or incentives, uh, so that companies begin to really behave in a way that they really stay away. I mean, I don't really mind companies making money they must make because that is why they are there. But they need to create more value because when value is created, you can distribute the value. But if you're working only on the profit part of it, then profits will go only in the few hands or in the few pockets. So these are the three things, hold people and companies accountable, give them incentive, and make this 1.23 billion students while studying in schools and colleges as a part of the solution. And they are the ones who will really change the things because tomorrow they will get married. They will come out, they will work. They will have a different kind Thanks, of society Dr. in which they're going to So I just urge everyone to read this document and uh, realize what the other side of the internet is doing to us. And we definitely need uh, collaborative efforts for it. And uh, for that, we need individual actions. Thank you. And I thank my expert panelists uh, joining, making very important interventions, giving us uh, action items uh, for the future. And those who asked us very important questions, giving us the dimensions that we need to still complete this document to make it more comprehensive. And I look forward to each one of you working with us at the Dynamic Coalition of Internet Jobs. A big round of applause for my expert panelists. Thank you.